<laughs> Nobody watches them anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> except me. I gotta get some views. So. I watch them. I watch, I watch them. them. I watch them. But I had this analytical class, and um, I did all the labs, but I got behind in the lab reports. And, oh, no. and my guy who said, you will never be, you will never be chemist. You wear shorts, you no good, you don't even care. And I was like, oh, come on, Dr. Ng. I, you know I care, I've been here for, and then he said, okay, I tell you what, Jim, you, I don't think you can do it, but if you, if you do it. It's a terrible guy. Well, it's who he was. It's how he talks. And, and he, but he, like, he just wouldn't give me the chance. And then he said, okay, I'll give you the chance, basically, and turn it in by Friday. Oh, no. Oh, no. And I had like eight reports, and it was Monday. And I was like, all right. Well, she had five days. Five days, like eight reports. Like, oh, you're Thomas for tomorrow. Like, oh, I'm, but I'm saying I'm not doing that to you guys. You have until the end of the semester. But I did all five reports, and they were really good, by the way. I mean, high quality work. But you, you get behind. It's on you. It's not on me, right? I had deadlines for those reports. I just didn't follow them. Right, and, and he was kind enough to give me a chance to do the work. And so ever since then, I've always been kind enough to let people do the work. And it's, but the deadlines are there so that you can do them in a row and know where you are. But if you get behind because of this school or, or, or weddings or whatever it is that gets in the way of your life, like anxiety or problems with your family it's not you don't have to compact that into that trauma you can spread it out and then do it the last week and put all that trauma in the last week of class all right so uh, i hope that helps but try to uh, keep reminding you to turn them in as you can and that makes it easier for the people that are grading them I just decided to do this right now. So this is this is this is an example of me doing my best work right now. All right, um, three. Did I finish three twenty nine? Oh yeah. Okay. So question one. There's all kinds of things going on in this class. Human HCL is a strong acid. What does that mean? And in aqueous solution. Three. 
that's four. work on it in class together, right? It's not, a, these nice quizzes are always group work, so.
Given HCl is a strong acid, what does that mean? Well, strong acid means it completely dissociates into its ionic form. Right. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. Strong acid donates the entire proton. You come completely apart. Because it forms, it only goes one way. Once it comes apart, it doesn't go back together. So it's completely separated into its ions. That makes it an electrolyte. Right. Which means it carries, what's that called? When you measure it, we, we measured that. Conductivity, it's conductive. The solution is conductive. Okay. This one, P. Oxidation numbers, right? We start with O2 is 2 minus. There are three O2s. That's, uh, no, four. <laughs> I can't count. So that's a minus eight, okay? Minus eight overall. We have a minus three charge, so that means in order to stay minus three, we have to add five. So whatever contribution comes from the positive side, it's going to be five, and it's going to be spread out over one phosphorus. So phosphorus is plus five, okay, for its oxidation number. Could you repeat that again, the beginning of that? What you said, sorry. Go ahead. That's so is it five for every equation, or does it just depend on the form of the equation? Uh, Polyatomic ions? Yeah, is it five all the time? Or is mm -hmm. it, is it's five, five every time it's phosphate. Okay, okay. Phosphate, when it's combined, phosphorus, when it's combined with oxygen, PO4, well, here's, let's just do another one. Ah. And all new ones, now they're all old ones. PO3, right? Three minus, right? So this is gonna have O2, ah. Oxygen's oxidation state is always two minus, unless it's a hydroxide, I mean peroxide, and then it's not, correct yourself. So this is minus six, but it has to end at a minus three, so we have to add three. So in this case, the three is distributed through one phosphorus, so it's a plus three oxidation number. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So no, it doesn't always have to be five, even for the same element the oxidation number can change. And that's how we track the, the movement of electrons, right? We, this, this phosphorus lost three electrons, this phosphorus lost five electrons. Okay. Uh, well, or sharing, we should say. Magnesium carbonate, Mg is a second column element, so it has plus two charge. Carbonate has a two minus which means we look at the oxygens, one, two, three, that's six minus. We need a two minus for that, so that means four plus gives us two minus. So carbon is four plus oxygen two and magnesium two. And then finally, sodium, first column, alkali metal, plus one. And then this is a minus one overall. Three oxygens, we already know that's minus six. So plus five. And that's where you can start thinking, oh, in nitrate, nitrogen's plus five, and phosphate, phosphorus is plus five. Oh, there might be a correlation. Just happens. So nitrogen is plus five here, two minus, and one plus. So how would you want those answers written out, like B? What would your answer, what would you, I mean, you wrote everywhere, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can't really. What would, how would So you what, the way, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let's, let's say, let's I put the I math in. There's all kinds of ways of doing it that would indicate to me that you know what you're talking about, but you could say oxidation number phosphorus equals five, oxidation number oxygen equals two minus, uh, oxidation number Mg equals two plus, oxidation number carbon equals four plus, 
oxidation number oxygen equals two minus. That would be one way. The other way is to just write it on top. Plus one, plus five, two minus. But any, any of those would be really be acceptable. This is probably, you know, a little bit more rigorous than what you should be shooting for. But during a test, you may not have time to be shooting for perfection, and you just do this. So that's the oxidation number. Okay. okay. And then give the balanced chemical equation net ionic equation, the total ionic equation for hydrobromic acid, HBr. And that's a new list of strong acid plus calcium hydroxide. So acid, proton donor, hydroxide, base. So acid plus base is going to be a neutralization. It's going to give us water, right? And then we're going to do a double displacement on these two, so we need CaBr2. Oh, I don't need that. Br2, aqueous, and water, liquid, and then aqueous. And this is a two here. Aqueous and aqueous. And we're going to need two of these. And two of these. These twos, I don't know, I don't know where I would learn to do twos, but apparently that person should be shot. Okay. So that's the balanced chemical equation. Now we're just going to take it apart for the total ionic. So 2H plus, and we're going to do our aqueous plus 2Br minus aqueous plus calcium 2 plus aqueous. Again. Twos. I'm going to have a hard time getting over those. Two minus aqueous plus. Oh, I didn't look up the solubility. Maybe this isn't soluble. Yeah, I was going to say it because it's solid. Can we look it up in our, our solubility table? It could be a solid. That would make a difference. process. Soluble. soluble or insoluble? The BR? Yeah. It is soluble. It is soluble. Yeah. It, unless it's with? AG, HG2, or PV. Aha. Uh -huh. So it is soluble. But good points that you always test check your solubility. So it's CA2 plus, AQ, oh look at this, this is a nice one, plus um, 2 BR aqueous <coughs> plus 2 H2O. The liquid is what's formed, so it stays together. And now we just look for the spectator ions 2 BR calcium, and then we're left with 2H, <laughs> Z, we're left with Z. Well, it's a good thing this is in the math class. 2H plus aqueous plus, oh, why is it always 2? <laughs> H2O, no, OH, it's confusing. Now I'm in my own head. All right, here we go. AQ, 2 H two O liquid. All right. That's why. That's why when I make a Z, I do this because <laughs> it looks like a two. Okay. So that was the basic quiz. Right. Um, we have to be able to do those. Maybe not that fast. Maybe like twenty minutes would be appropriate for those three problems. I think. Um, Just wondering when you do the O H and you do the minus on the O H. Does it matter if you write it on the inside or on the outside? Well, yeah, so the, I believe the convention is on the outside. I believe, right? But it doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to hold you accountable to that. Okay. 
And because I've seen it this way and the other way, it, it just depends. And you, but you definitely want to make sure you have the minus, right? Because it's definitely hydroxide. And in, in this case, you could even not do parentheses and just do OH minus. Right, I was just being, I don't know why I did it. Okay. So based on this list, everybody will get five points from whatever's on that list. Yeah. Why is the precipitate not in the net ion? It, there isn't one. This, this is soluble. This is, this is still AQ. Oh. Right. So yeah, normally we're looking for precipitate, but the precipitate in this case, instead of being a precipitate, we make water. We added water to the solution. That's the product. Calcium bromide just floats around still in the solution. So that's why it's not. Because it was calcium on this side, calcium on that side, bromine on this side, bromine on that side. So it's just a spectator. Yeah, Ben. Are we going to want to use the solubility chart on the next one? Yeah, I don't expect you to memorize that at all. I would hope that you start realizing what hydroxide is without looking at and there's like six strong acids, you should probably probably be aware of those. And of course, phosphate, carbonate, nitrate. It's probably, I mean, you know, we talk about them a lot, so they should start being real familiar. It's the obscure ones, like I'm not gonna ask you for oxalate, C2O4, but I could. In which case, and since I'm letting you use those polyatomic ion tables, it's, it's okay too. All right. So participation quiz today, no big deal. Just wanted to get us, our minds back on track to, we, we don't just have to come in for lecture, we gotta kind of turn our minds off a little bit, um, me especially. I wanted to start going back over just a little bit more that the half reaction type stuff. Oxidation reduction. Right, a term that you should know, polyprotic acid. Let's pick up. Let's pick up where we, where, what we were finishing with before, and start over on that idea, and go over the slides one more time. So oxidation reduction reactions: two magnesium solids plus oxygen gas yields two magnesium oxide solid. How do we form these cations and anions? Question. And magnesium is oxidized, it loses electrons, right? So it goes from, every element goes from an elemental state with an equal number of protons and electrons to a different state. If it goes to a different state, it's gonna lose electrons or gain electrons. So magnesium metal is balanced on the reactant side, but on the product side, it's lost two electrons. So magnesium is oxidized. Oxygen, in the natural gas state, diatomic molecule, like the seven, I have, have no fear of ice cold beer, you're going to gain electrons. So it goes to a minus two. We can view that as a combination of half reactions, right? We can look at just the magnesium going from the solid state and then losing two electrons. 
each time. There's two of them, so each one loses two, so a total of four electrons. And you notice that when we oxidize, the electrons go on the product side of the half reaction. When we reduce the electrons, like oxygen, we reduce the electrons go on the reactive side. So we're going to balance the number of electrons, right? We don't have a balanced chemical equation if we have more charges going from the reactant side to the product side or vice versa. You have to have the same charges transferring across the reaction. So 2MgS plus O2 minus, or O2 gas, I should say, yields two magnesium oxides. And the electrons balance therefore not included in the reaction. So oxidation reactions, we went over these. Iron three is reduced, so we have in the compound iron three oxide. We have oxygen with a minus two, and iron with a plus three, plus carbon in its gas, uh, gas in its elemental state for a zero. And then we go to the other side. Iron is now a zero. And oxygen is now a minus two, and like it was before, but carbon is now a plus four. Okay. So iron three is reduced to iron, it gains electrons. Carbon goes from zero to plus four, so it loses electrons. Now, if we just look at this, we don't know exactly how many electrons we have to do the math, and we're gonna be doing that moving forward. So here we have carbon sulfide, sulfide being like oxygen, a two minus in a compound. So that's gonna be a minus four charge total that carbon has to carry. So the opposite of a minus four charge, so plus four. So carbon's plus four on that side, it comes over here. It's still plus four. Chlorine is zero and goes to minus one. So chlorine is reduced. Sulfur goes from minus two to plus two, so it's oxidized. Okay. The net shift of electrons from one compound to another is how we define oxidation reduction. We completely transfer the electrons from one element to another. And the net shifting of electrons then, right, is when they kind of move into the area, they're distributed unevenly, right? So that's what a shift is, that's composed to the complete transfer. So complete transfer is an ionic transfer, a shift is the oxidation reduction. Assume reactions give compounds where all elements take their common oxidation states, as if the compound was ionic. What's an oxidation number? Right? That's the charge we're associating with that element in a compound. The general rules, again, atoms in elemental form, oxidation number zero. So it's possible to get all kinds of partial credit when we're talking about re oxidation reduction problems because you may identify some parts correctly and some parts incorrectly. The idea is to not leave it blank, just try, come up with some numbers. Right. The more you come up with numbers, the more you start seeing how they make sense and when they don't. Monoatomic ions, sodium, sulfur, equal the ionic charge. Sum of all oxidation values in a compound formula unit or polyatomic ion equals the overall charge. And that overall charge is zero if the compound is neutral. Examples, oxidation number NO3 minus, we just did that on the board, right? But again, oxygen is minus two, so that takes precedence. So three oxygens minus six, there's one minus left over, so we have to have a plus five. Nitrogen is plus five. Okay. Here's some more specific <laughs> rules. Group one, plus one in all compounds. Group two, plus two in all compounds. Hydrogen, plus one when combined with non-metals. So when hydrogen's combined with oxygen or nitrogen, it's plus one. When it's combined with metals like sodium, potassium, magnesium, platinum, it's minus one, and it's called hydride. Fluorine, 
minus one in all compounds. Fluorine is the massive collector of electrons. Nobody does it better than fluorine. Oxygen, minus one in peroxides. What's a peroxide? That's the O2 as a polyatomic ion. But the rest of the time, it's just minus two. And how do we know it's a polyatomic ion? It'll either be named a peroxide or it will be in brackets. Oxygen takes precedence over everything except fluorine. So OF compounds, oxygen is not the electron donor. Group seven, all minus one. Identifying, we have the transfer of shift of electrons. One gains, one loses. The one that loses is oxidized, the one that gains is reduced. We say the one that is oxidized is a reducing agent because it's going to uh, give up its electrons, cause something to re be reduced. And why is the oxidizing agent? Because when it's reduced, it's taking somebody's electron, causing it to be oxidized. It's, it's real easy to get these two backwards. But you increase the oxidation number when you're oxidized. You go from zero to plus two, or from two minus to zero. When you're gaining electrons, you go the other way. You go from two plus to zero, or from zero to two minus. Again, we did this already. Oxidation number of iron, it's just an ion, so the oxidation number is two plus. For ammonia, hydrogen is with a non-metal, so it's a plus one. So there are three pluses, so oxidation of nitrogen is three minus. HSO3 minus hydrogen with a non-metal, so it's a plus one. And then sulfite, right, has an, oh, oh the whole thing has an overall minus one charge, I should say. So oxygen, again, two minus, there's three of them, that's six minus. So between hydrogen and sulfur, you need a plus five. And since hydrogen is plus one, by definition, then sulfur has to be plus four. Potassium permanganate. Potassium, column one, plus one. Permanganate, the polyatomic anion, is a minus one. So overall, we know that MnO4 is a minus one. Oxygen has a two minus charge four times. So overall minus eight for the permanganate ion. Four of these, minus eight, still a minus. So we have to have one minus left over, so manganese is plus seven. H2O2 is a peroxide, hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen is plus one, the first priority, and oxygen is minus one equal to the charge peroxide. So two hydrogens, two plus, the two plus has to be distributed over two oxygens, so each oxygen is minus one. <coughs> I probably will not give you a peroxide. Then we went over why um, ammonium nitrate is a explosive, and it's because in ammonium ion, nitrogen is minus three, and in nitrate, it's plus five. So that huge, quick transfer of electrons is a lot of energy. And it also makes a lot of electrons available for biological purposes as well. So identifying the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent in each of the following reactions. We have zinc as a solid, elemental zinc, so it's a zero. And then on the other side, it's complex, right? So zinc two plus, so it goes from zero to two plus. Does people see that? Yeah. Okay. So from zero to two plus, now we're talking about um, being oxidized, so it's a reducing agent. Then we have hydrogen as a plus one because it's with a polyatomic ion. Sulfate is a two minus overall. 
8 minus 2 left over plus 6 for sulfur. On this side, it stays the same. The polyatomic ion didn't change, so the electron and structure didn't change. And then hydrogen went from plus 1 to its gaseous state, which is elemental, and 0. So hydrogen went from plus 1 to 0, so it was reduced and is therefore an oxidizing agent. It's, you can take any equation that's oxidation reduction, and they're, they're everywhere. You just type in oxidation reduction on Google and then just start putting numbers with your compounds and pretty soon it'll just it'll be better at it than I am. I shouldn't say it much, but it'll still be better. All right, so aluminum plus iron three oxide breaks down the same way. Aluminum is zero on the reactive side. It's complex. That's a dead giveaway that there's an electronic change. If you go from elemental form to a compound, something happened. Some electrons were shifted. And in this case, three electrons for each aluminum were shifted. You had a minus six charge from the oxide, and you split that among two aluminums, plus six among two aluminums, plus three. So aluminum was definitely oxidized. Again, metals tend to be oxidized. If, if you're gonna guess and you don't know, guess that the metal is oxidized. Guess that the non-metal is reduced. Right, it's all, it, it's, there's these simple little trends that we can use to predict most of the chemistry that we do in this class. So it's a reducing agent. Iron goes from three plus to zero, right? And so if it's two metals changing electrons, the product side is gonna be the one that's elemental, that's gonna be reduced. The reactive side is the one that's going to be oxidized. So you don't see iron on this side, so it's got to be the one that's being reduced. You don't see aluminum by itself on this side, so it's got to be the one that's oxidized. And let's look at this. C, we have carbon sulfide, <clears throat> sulfide of 2 minus, carbon of 4 plus, chlorine gas in the elemental state is a zero. Over here, chlorine's complex, so it had to have some electronic shift. It goes to minus one. Carbon stays at plus four. So carbon is out as a possibility of being oxidized or reduced. Then we come over here to sulfur. Sulfur is now plus one. It was a minus two. So it's definitely been oxidized. And then chlorine minus one, so it's, you could say that either way. It's also, sulfur goes from minus two to plus one, so it's a reducing agent because it was oxidized. And chlorine goes from zero to minus one, so it was reduced, but it is an oxidizing agent. All right. Permanganate again. We already saw permanganate. We know it's plus seven minus two. That's the other beauty, right? Once you know the oxidation states, of the polyatomic ions. So if you memorize the polyatomic ions and then you know their oxidation states, that's gonna cut out a lot of work, right? A lot of memory, a lot of math, a lot of time. So anyway, permanganate, we saw it earlier, so I remember just from the last problem that manganese is plus seven and oxygen is minus two. Then we have iron, why, why is that, that's not, what the heck is that? That's not right. Hold on, Jim. What the heck happened there? Uh, I don't know. <sighs> but I caught it before we guys said anything, so. So for that one on iron, you're like giving us the oxidation number already? Yeah, so whenever it's in the ionic state, that is the oxidation number, so iron two plus. But if it was zero, that would have had to make this an iron solid, right? Because that would have been the elemental state. So having the zero there had to be fixed. And then plus one. So we're, we're just adding ions together as reactants and then seeing if a change takes place. So this is pretty cool, right? So if you put permanganate, iron two plus, and hydrogen as a proton, so an acidic media, you're gonna have a reduction of 
manganese to manganese from manganese seven to manganese two. Um, you're going to make water, and you're going to you're going to oxidize iron. Pretty cool. If, if that's a true reaction, It'd just be saying ammonia plus hydronium ion, right? Which is another way of saying H plus in water forms ammonia and water. And this, I've got this being completely dissociative. It's not. It mostly stays on this side. So ammonia, hydrogen is bonded to a non-metal, so it's a minus one. Nitrogen, then, is three minus. Good, I said that backwards, right? Hydrogen is bonded to a non-metal, so it's plus one. Nitrogen, therefore, carries the charge of the three hydrogens. And what we're really talking about here is that those electrons that were on hydrogen are super close to the nitrogen, acting as if they're in the, sh the control of nitrogen as opposed to in the control of hydrogen. The, the elements themselves are close together, but the electrons are closer to nitrogen, leaving a positive charge on the outside of the molecule. So no elements change oxidation numbers in this one, so it's not a redox reaction. I will not do that to you on purpose. Depends how early I have to test them. Okay, so we talked about combustion reactions as well, right? So combustion reactions are anything with oxygen available. So any reaction you do with fire in open air, it's gonna be a combustion reaction. You can stop that by working in a closed environment and heating things in a vacuum, and then you do not have combustion. So you can do these, all these reactions without the presence of oxygen, and it will change to a non-combustion reaction. So this is octanes, two octanes, C8, H18 is octane, and then um, it takes 25 oxygen units, to make 16 carbon dioxides and 18 waters. And that's basically what the internal combustion engine does, is it converts long chain hydrocarbons into CO2 and 18H2. Here's a way to think of a combustion engine. It's like a human on fire, right? Because we take oxygen, we combust it, I think cars get better mileage out of their CO2 than we do. I'm not sure. I never did that comparison before because I just thought of it. But isn't that amazing? So if we could make like a, a reverse car that ate CO2 and spit out water, or spit out oxygen, that'd be pretty cool. All right, and it'd be like we'd never run out. Just park under the tree, charge up, keep going. You know, so on Los Osos Valley Road, where I live, one of the old ranchers used to have about a half mile of trees you know, on either side of the driveway, all the way up to the house. And like just every day when I drove by there, you just smelled the oxygen. And they cut down all those trees. can't smell the oxygen anymore because the trees aren't converting CO2 to oxygen. Very sad. They've been there probably 100 years old. Anyway, not that I'm like following pagan rituals or a druid or anything, but I do feel the difference between having the trees there and not having the trees there. And if we want to have a sustainable planet, we need greenery convert CO2 into oxygen because all the saving of CO2 in the world won't do any good and make a production of CO2 won't do any good unless we have some way of converting it to oxygen mm -hmm. uh, or to keep increasing greenhouse gases especially if we keep cutting down trees and during my time like in the 70s you know 1970 way way back before like recorded history they um they were talking about what's gonna happen 
when we cut down the rainforest. We weren't worried about CO2 emissions from vehicles at that point. We were worried about, wow, CO2 is going to increase because we're going to cut down all the rainforests. And we cut down all the rainforests and CO2 increased, but we stopped talking about cutting down forests and we focused on the automobile being the cause. Very interesting. Just to watch the progression of the time. Sorry about that. Those trees. Two MG plus O2 gas. And then, so you can do it, you can do it with a straight chain hydrocarbon, make carbon dioxide and water. You can take a metal, burn it in the presence of oxygen, and make a metal oxide, which is a reduction, right? And then you can also do it with like a carbohydrate or a sugar, and you can put that with oxygen, and then again, make CO2 and water. So again, burning fossil fuels is very similar to burning sugar in the human body. Oh. So we could maybe even go as far as to say that burning fossil fuels is a biological process. And guess what? It occurs in nature. Oh well. Just so, uh, just, I mean, not to the extent that it does in an automobile, right? I'm not saying nature is burning the same amount of fuel as human beings. Don't, don't conflate the two. For the following, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not trying to create World War III here. That's poop. For the following reactions, give a balanced equation and identify the type of reaction. If it's a redox reaction, identify it. Okay, so the reaction of nitrogen trioxide, which I mentioned, is nitrogen gas. Um, I mean, it's a contact explosive that sophomores or freshmen like to prank the older chemistry students with. The reaction of nitrogen triiodide to give dinitrogen gas and diiodine. All right, so N with I3. I3 is a halogen, halogens are minus one. There are three of them, so nitrogen in this case is plus three. Goes to nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is elemental, so it's a zero. So we go from plus three nitrogen to zero nitrogen, it's reduced. So nitrogen is an oxidizing agent. And then we have I2, which is zero, from minus one. So it's oxidized and is therefore a reducing agent. So this is an oxidation reduction, obviously. Yeah, you guys just said all this, all right? Two, the reaction of dioxygen gas with iron three sulfide to give iron three oxide and sulfur dioxide. So if we look at that reaction, we start with oxygen as a, as a gas in the elemental state. We go to the other side, it's minus two, so reduced, definitely. Then iron's three plus, stays three plus, so it's not oxidized or reduced, but sulfur goes from two minus to four plus. That's six electrons per sulfur. So there you go. Oxidation reduction. The rhenium pentoxide, we're not going over that one again. The reaction of nitrogen gas, nitrogen oxide gas with water to form nitric acid and nitrogen oxide. So we have NO2, plus H2O forms nitric acid plus nitrogen monoxide. So oxygen two minus, two of them minus four. Balance it out with nitrogen, nitrogen plus four. Then we have hydrogen plus one with oxygen minus two. We go to the other side, we have hydrogen plus one. But now we have nitrate, and we, we remember from earlier today that nitrate, nitrogen is plus five. And we can do the math again if you want because there's three oxygens at minus two, so minus six. Overall minus charge for the nitrate, so nitrogen is plus five. Then when we go to nitrogen monoxide, there's one oxygen at two minus, so nitrogen's two plus. This is kind of unique because nitrogen goes from four plus to five plus, mm -hmm. making it a reducing agent. And nitrogen goes from four plus to two plus, so it's also an oxidizing agent. This is an example of a compound that both oxidizes and reduces. This is called a disproportionation reaction. That will not be one of the questions. So you don't have to define that. But it's nice to know. It's nice to know that you can take one part of your reaction and make it go 
to reduction and to oxidation. And you can take advantage of that. Our body does that a lot, a lot. All right. So balancing these redu oxidation reduction, I got all the way to where I wanted to start. And we have like 10 minutes. What is wrong with the following oxidation reduction? Okay, so here we have MnO4 plus 2Fe plus 8H yields Mn2 plus, Fe3 plus, plus 4. Well, we don't know. Well, let's look at the total charge. So here we have minus 1 plus 2 plus 8, so plus 10, minus 1, so a total of plus 9. But on the product side, we have plus 2 plus 3, that's 5. And that's it. So we lost four electrons. We can't lose electrons in a, a reaction. It's like conservation of mass, conservation of matter. You can't just throw electrons under the bus like that. You gotta, you gotta count, electrons count. So we try again. We go MnO4 minus plus five Fe2 plus eight H plus Mn2 plus plus five Fe3 plus plus 4H, so 17 on this side, and then 10 plus 8 minus 1, 17 on that side, now it's balanced. Right, so we had to change one of the participants in the reaction to balance it out, that's all. Mass and charge balance. Yeah, you want, you, you want to be balanced. So how do we do it? These are the steps. We write the two half reactions. We write what's being oxidized with the electrons on the product side. We write what's being reduced with the electrons on the reactant side. We balance all elements except oxygen and hydrogen. We balance oxygen by adding waters. So if we don't have enough oxygens on one side, we add a water to the other side. We don't have enough hydrogens, we add H pluses. We balance charge by adding E minuses. Electrons will appear on opposite sides of half reactions if necessary. Multiply half reactions by the lowest common multiples. Right, so we have to balance out the charges in the two. And we can do that. Again, we can't take them apart and put them together the way we want, but we can do multiples just like we did when we were balance and compounds. And then finally, add the two half reactions to cancel out any E's and any species that appear on both sides of the equation. Okay. So what does that look like? Oh, there are two caveats, we'll do those later. So write the balanced equation, redox equation for the reaction of dichromate ion and copper one to give chromium three and copper two in acidic solution. So first step, write the half reaction. So chromium, Cr2, O7, 2 minus, goes to Cr3 plus. What is the charge of chromium right now? So minus 14, minus 2, so plus 12, divided over two chromiums, chromium 6. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Minus 14, so minus 12, because it's going to stay two, two minuses. Chromium, there's two of them, so it's going to be plus six. So chromium six to chromium three. Then copper one to copper two. Now we have the mass and charge balance half reactions. So looking at the first one, we have to get, we have to do the waters first, right? So we have to add you guys with me on what we're trying to do? We have seven oxygens on this side, so we need seven oxygens on the product side. On the product side, we can't just add oxygen, we have to add water, right? We add, that's part of the rules. You can use the rules. I'll let you use the rules. I don't think you have to memorize those. You can use the rules as well. I mean, it's easier if you do enough of them that you don't even have to look at the rules. That would be the ultimate. But having the rules there and being familiar with them will help. So we're gonna balance out the oxygens by adding water. So now we have seven times two hydrogens, right? 
14 hydrogens, but we had no hydrogens over here to start with. And how do we have to add hydrogen? As a proton, as an H plus. So now we add 14 H plus. All right. We have two chromium threes, so we're going from six plus to three plus twice. So we have to add six electrons. Right, remember this is chromium six, right? This side's chromium three. So if we go over there once, we've added three electrons. But we're going over twice, so we add three electrons two times, or six electrons. Why are you going over there twice, though? Because there's two chromiums here and two chromiums there. Each chromium goes from six plus to three plus. So each time we do it, we have three electrons we have to add. Is there anybody with me at all? Gaining momentum, right? So where are you lost? Okay, let's let's go over it again. So in order to, we can calculate the chromium charge, right? Two minus for each. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Here we go. We're gonna do it on the board, and we have probably just enough time. We don't have time to get to step six and seven. We have time to get. We have time to get to step two. <laughs> So, but I like, I like that we went over everything uh, prior to that, that we did on Tuesday. That makes sense. So we have chromium, two oxide, seven minus. Is it two minus? Right. Dichromate. All right, so there's seven oxygen at, at two minus. One, two, oh, that's a bad one. Two, three. So you guys matter. So look at how hard I'm working. One, two. It's fine. Two, three, four, five, six, and we're back to these. Seven. So that's minus 14. We have an overall charge on the ion of minus two. So minus 14, and we want to end with minus two, so we have to add plus 12. If we add plus 12, we have to distribute plus 12 over two chromiums. That makes each chromium plus six, okay? And um, well, what was that? Oh, that's it? Yeah, all right. But we're gonna have to add things, so I gotta leave some room. Here we have, on this side we have chromium, two chromium, three plus, okay? So, this is chromium six plus, two chromium six plus twice. That's the way we can look at the chromium. And then it comes over here to three plus. And then we have to balance out oxygens in the half reaction. The only way we can balance out oxygens is to add H2O. So we have seven oxygens, we wanna balance that out, we have to put a seven here. So now we have seven oxygens on this side, seven oxygens on that side, two chromiums on each side. But we have 14 hydrogens we gotta take care of. The only way we can add hydrogens is by H plus. So we're gonna add 14 H plus, okay? But we have everything taken care of now except for the charge because we have the charge going from plus six to plus three. So we have a reduction. Reduction, when we balance out charge, the electrons go on the reactant side, so we have to add 60. Three, three for the first chromium to go from six to plus three, right? Mm -hmm. And then three for the second chromium to go from three. And now we've balanced out that half reaction, and we're done. And we'll pick up on Tuesday with more of this half reaction balancing, the difference between acid and base balancing as well. It's not